There's an indicator we need some energy. Fortunately, cells don't have much AMP. It's not very commonly found. Most of the time, this guy does not flip into the R state because there's very little AMP. Well, what flips it into the T state? ATP. What does ATP tell the cell? We have plenty of energy. Do we want to break down our glycogen? Absolutely not. That converts the enzyme back into the T state. The enzyme does very little. Glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate is an intermediate in glycolysis. If it starts accumulating, what does that mean? It means that glycolysis is getting plugged up, which means the cell isn't needing all that energy. Another indicator of high energy. When the enzyme is in the B form, it most commonly is found in the T state. That's why we say it's the less active form of glycogen phosphorylase. Because on average, it's going to be in the T state. Now, let's look at glycogen phosphorylase A. It's even simpler. <laughs> as, if that was, as if that was simple. It's, not, it's, it's, it's simple, though. If we want to convert glycogen phosphorylase A into the T state, we have to have an abundance of free glucose. An abundance of free glucose would also indicate the cell is full of energy. It's not breaking that glucose down. That doesn't happen very often. Okay? It's much more common it'll have glucose 6 phosphate than it will have glucose because we've got a hexokinase. Remember, that's going to put a phosphate on there. Rarely do, does a cell have much free glucose. Rarely does this guy flip into the T state. Well, what flips it into the R state? Nothing. If there's no glucose, it will automatically flip into the R state. That means that glycogen phosphorylase A, on average, is going to be found in the R state. And it's for that reason we think of glycogen phosphorylase A as being the more active form of the enzyme. Now, I know that's a lot of material and a lot of considerations. I'm going to try to do what, what you just suggested, which I'm going to do is simplify in a moment. Okay? Do I have any questions before I try my simplification? Yes, sir. Yep. Where does AMP come from? You haven't seen it yet, right? Yeah. Very good question. Yeah, let me answer your question since you've asked it. It's a very good one. How do we get AMP? All right? Because you haven't seen any reactions that make AMP. AMP is a last gasp of the cell to harvest energy. When does it make, when does it make AMP? I'll tell you when. So let's say I'm a muscle cell, and I'm out there, and I'm, act I'm, I'm contracting and doing my thing. And this guy's heart isn't delivering enough oxygen, so I'm starting to run out of energy. I'm not getting as much energy as I need. And what's going to happen? My ATP levels are going to start falling. My ADP levels are going to go up because it's ATP that's converted into ADP. I've got all this ADP sitting around, but very little ATP. Cells have an enzyme called adenylate kinase. You don't need to know that. But adenylate kinase will do the following reaction, which is very cool. It will take ADP plus another ADP and make ATP and AMP. That's how we get AMP. So it's a last gasp to make ATP when there's no other mechanisms available to the cell. That keeps the cell going. And meanwhile, AMP accumulates. Whoa, we're in deep doo-doo. You better get something going when AMP starts going on. And that's what this is signaling. Does that make sense? Yes, sir, Stuart. Why we're going to do it going to what? OK, so these are enzymes. This is not the phosphorylase. This is called phosphorylase kinase. This is an enzyme that puts a phosphate on. As I said, we're not going to worry about the enzyme names here. This is a phosphatase. That's a phosphatase that takes the enzyme off. In general, kinases put phosphates on. Phosphatases take them off. But an enzyme is necessary to do this interconversion. We're not going to go behind into that right now, no. Okay. 
I'm much more interested in under, having you understand wh how the enzyme is controlled than what the enzymes are that play roles in that, because that gets it even more complicated. Okay, Casey. These two enzymes? Yes. If they're both active, let's say they're both in the R form. You bet. You bet. When they're in the R form, they're going to they're gonna act. The main difference is that this one's not going to be in the R form very often, and this one in the R form very often. This guy's going to be in the R form all the t almost all the time. OK? All right. I promised you a simplification. Let's have a simplification. All right? There's two things happening here. The two things that are happening here is a covalent modification. Putting phosphate on or taking phosphate off. Those are covalent modifications. We're making and breaking bonds. The enzyme is being covalently modified. It's, going to be, it's being chemically changed. That covalent modification is what converts between B to A or A to B. We'll talk later in the term about hormones involved in controlling this process. So if you think about, all right, when I've got to understand the regulation of this enzyme, I have to first of all understand, does it have a phosphate on or does it not have phosphate on? All right? That's the first question you ask yourself. Then, depending upon if it has no phosphate on, I have the B form. And I say, these guys are the second type of regulation. These are allosteric regulations. External molecules are binding to the enzyme and affecting its activity. ATP, GTP, I'm, I'm sorry, ATP, G6P, indicating high energy, turn it off, put in the T state. AMP, danger Will Robinson, we're getting low on energy, converts it into the R state. On the other side, the A can only be turned off by glucose, and there's very little free glucose in the cell. In the absence of glucose, the enzyme stays in the R state. Yes, sir? Wouldn't that mean the cell is always breaking down glycogen? Wouldn't that mean the cell is always breaking down glycogen? The answer is no, it's not. And it turns out that this interconversion back and forth plays a role. And as we will see later when I talk about hormones, hormones will actually convert this guy back to this state. Such as insulin. Such as insulin. Correct. And since he's brought it up, I'll just say it here, OK? You don't need to know this. I'll just throw this out to you, all right? Hormones that convert this guy from left into right, epinephrine. Epinephrine, also known as adrenaline. Adrenaline causes you to have great energy. Pick up a car if a baby's under it because you're scared, right? It's real. It actually happens. And the reason it happens is adrenaline stimulates all of your glycogen phosphorylase to go into this state, and you dump a ton of glucose immediately for your muscles. Bang, you can do it. OK? What caused it to go back to the left? Insulin. If you think about what insulin does, insulin is telling your body there's too much blood glucose. Insulin stimulates your cells to take up glucose so as to reduce the blood concentration of glucose. And when it gets there, the cells are going, wait a minute, you brought all this glucose in. What's going to happen if I bring all the glucose in? Going back here? Back here. We're turning off glycogen breakdown because we've got all this glucose. What do we want to do if we have a ton of glucose? We want to make glycogen. Right? Now, these enzymes that I just described to you that cause this to go this way have opposite effects on the glycogen synthase. Insulin will stimulate glycogen synthase to be active. Start making glycogen. Epinephrine will turn off glycogen synthase. You don't want to be making glycogen if you need energy. Yes, sir? Um, I, I'm, I know there weren't already tests on this, but I'm just curious. Uh, is that why if, if somebody's diabetic, like they're not make, taking in insulin, yep. so they're not building up glycogen, is that why like one of the first things in, like, you know, when somebody gets, is diabetic, mm -hmm. they start losing a lot of weight? OK, so it's, his question is, if you are diabetic, uh, is one of the reasons that people have weight fluctuations because they're not making glycogen and so forth? The answer is no. Okay? The issues with, gly with, with diabetes have to do much more with the concentration of sugar in their blood. They do have some weight fluctuations, but weight fluctuations largely involve fat. 
And glycogen is actually a relatively small component of body mass. Okay. It may, it may be surprising to you, but it's true. All right? You have enough glycogen in your body to keep you alive for about a day. About a day. If you don't eat anything for a full day, you will start depleting your glycogen stores. It doesn't mean you're going to die. Obviously, you can go longer than that without eating. But your body is then going to start calling on other resources to make that glucose that you need. You have to have glucose. If you don't have glucose, you're in trouble. What resources are, is it going to use? The only resource you have that it can use is protein. It cannot use fat to make glucose. You cannot make fat from glucose. It's impossible for animals to do that. Plants can do it. We'll see how that occurs later. And bacteria can do it, but we cannot do that. Okay, does that make sense? Clear as mud? Any other questions on that? I've said it before, I'll say it again. Glucose is a poison. You've got to remember that. Your glucose is a poison to your body. The reason people with diabetes have a problem is because their blood glucose levels are going high and it kills things. It kills things. That's why your body maintains a relatively narrow range of glucose concentration so as not to have that poisonous effect. You say, that's just baloney. It's not baloney. The best evidence I can give you is how many times you've opened up a jar of jelly and you didn't put it in the refrigerator and it sat out for a week and nothing happened to it. The reason nothing happened to it was because it's loaded with sugar. It's stopping bacterial growth. That's the reason they put so much sugar in jelly. Yes, after a long time, mold will grow, but bacteria will not grow in it. Okay? It's a poison. Okay. All right, we'll come back to that later. Any other questions about this? All right. Okay, uh, glycogen synthase uh, plays a role. We're not going to talk about that. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about, and then this will be the last material for the exam, is the pentose phosphate pathway. Oh my God, a whole other pathway, and he's going to do it in five minutes. Well, it's not very complicated. I mean, you know, it's pretty straightforward, right? All right, all right. We're at that point where you guys are saying, what do I need to know for the exam, right? <laughs> Come on, Ahern. All right. Pentose phosphate pathways is one of those pathways where I will literally tell you that. And part of it is because we don't have much time to spend on it. And part of it is because it looks way more complicated than it is. And why go into all the reactions of the pathway? It's not really pertinent. Why do we have the pentose phosphate pathway? Well, let's think about this. What does the name tell us, first of all? Five carbon sugars. Phosphates, right? Okay. The first thing that's important about this pathway is it helps us to make five carbon sugars. Name an important five carbon sugar for me. Fructose. Ribose. Fructose is a six carbon sugar. <laughs> it's, a ketose, it's a ketose and it makes a five member ring, but it's a six carbon sugar. Ribose is a five carbon sugar. We have to have ribose to make nucleotides. The pentose phosphate pathway helps us to make ribose, which we use to make nucleotides. Specifically, we make ribose 5-phosphate, which is the pentose phosphate part of it. Okay. Now, the starting material for the pentose phosphate pathway is glucose 6-phosphate. One of the reasons we have a lot of glucose 6-phosphate is so we can make things. We're seeing now a branch off of going from Portland. Instead of going up to Seattle, we'll take a branch and go out to the Dalles. All right? This branch out to the Dalles is going to take us to the pentose phosphate pathway. And it's going to go with glucose 6-phosphate. There's an oxidation reaction. In fact, there's a couple of oxidation reactions that are involved. And now we see a new electron carrier. The new electron carrier that's involved is NADP which is also a plus sign, by the way, NADP+. Plus. When it gets electrons, it makes NADPH. Why is that important? It turns out that NADPH is used a lot in anabolic reactions.